The following program is a production of the Maine Public Broadcasting Network. During the following program, look for the Maine PBS web markers, which lead you to more information on our website. In the 1600s, European settlers left everything they knew to take advantage of Maine's abundant resources. Despite backbreaking work, a harsh climate, and cultural clashes, they successfully carved out a new life for themselves. But by the end of the century, most of them would leave Maine in fear and live for years as war refugees. How Maine's first European survived on the frontier, next on Home, the Story of Maine. Production of Home, the Story of Maine on MPBN was made in partnership with the Maine State Museum. Major funding was provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a federal agency committed to fostering innovation, leadership, and a lifetime of learning. Additional funding was provided by Elsie Viles. I think most people don't realize that in the 17th century, Maine was the edge of settlement. And in fact, once you got more than five or 10 miles on the coast of Maine, the next European house would be in Canada. Well, we tend to think of, the, of our American settlement of frontier always expanding westward. The frontier in the 1600s and 1700s was, was right here in Maine. For the first Europeans who showed up here, the frontier was the forest, which they looked into, and they really could see nothing except trees and imagined animals and monsters and so on. And interestingly, for the Native American, it was exactly the opposite. For them, the frontier was the ocean, and that's where they put their monsters, because they knew what was in the trees. And of course for them it was even more of a shock because the Europeans come right to them out of this ocean, this area that they don't know, the unknown, and suddenly show up on their shores. I think the first reaction of natives throughout North America, to be honest, was that these are supernatural beings. Their technology, their general appearance, their arrival on huge ships, and their powerfulness. As soon as they interacted with them, they understood these were humans, but humans of an unusual sort. In the early 1600s, Europe's teeming populations have exhausted many natural resources. Land is scarce, and there are few economic opportunities. In England, in the 16th and 17th century, it is almost impossible to get land. You have a growing population, you have high unemployment rates, um, and uh, unless your family uh, is, a, is, a, is a family of substance and position, you have little or no land. Here, all of a sudden, I could have my own land, I could have my own house. It must have seemed pretty neat. In the late 1580s, European explorers become interested in the main coast and report back to their patrons about the incredible timber, the thick and plentiful beaver pelts, and especially the abundant fish. As a result, English merchants begin to set up seasonal fishing stations. The fishermen would come over, they'd come in large ships, and they'd carry along their little fishing shallops, which were usually two to three men vessels. And they would fish there, they'd set up on the shore, they'd put up staging for dressing the fish and uh, flakes for drying them. And they would work there for the season and uh, come fall, pack everything back up and head back to England. Well, obviously this was not the most convenient or efficient way to do it. And so the idea of fishing stations, year-round fishing stations, were obviously the next place to go. A wealthy English knight, Sir Ferdinando Gorges, sees tremendous economic opportunity and decides to establish a royalist colony in Maine. In 1616, he sends Richard Vines and a company of men to spend the year here. 
When Vines arrives, he finds thousands of Native Americans dying from European diseases that they contracted from traders and fishermen. The great dying was probably fundamental to the English settlement. The Native population was went down as much as 90%, some places absolutely totally gone. They, they, they were, everyone died. And so the English really moved into areas that uh, were almost deserted. Well, the English were just as dumbfounded as the natives were because they knew about disease, but they didn't know what caused it. Both they and the natives came away with the feeling that this was somehow or another the work of a higher being, in other words, the work of God. For the English, uh, who were, they just assumed that God wanted this to be their territory and this is their, his way of uh, opening it up for them to settle. In order to take advantage of the resources in New France, which they call Acadia, the French build a series of forts which serve as trading posts. Most of us, when we think of Down East Maine, think of some sort of wellspring of Yankee wit and humor. Uh, but as it turns out, most of the coast of Maine, which we call Down East, was in fact under French habitation, French and Native American habitation, through most of the colonial period. Acadia was governed by a bunch of minor noblemen, people who were land poor. And they had many a noble in France who had no prospect of wealth or anything of like that. And as a result, one of the few things these noble, noble individuals could do that was respectable was to engage in um, the fur trade and uh, maintaining uh, the fisheries and so forth. The capital of their new colony is at Fort Pentagoet in present-day Castine, located on the southwestern edge of New France. These early Frenchmen uh, more or less kept Native Americans at bay at the gates, uh, and they traded with them and dealt with them. But inside Pentagoet uh, was their own world, a little taste of France. As it turned out, all of the French were interested in keeping up with the latest fashions. And so, you see uh, the uh, folks, as we learn from uh, Fort Pentagoet, the commanders uh, going around uh, dressed with a gold uh, braid uh, on their shoulders and swords uh, slung by their uh, sides, although it's an obsolete weapon, spurs on their heels, although there were no horses to ride in Acadia. Everybody traveled in Acadia by boat. There were no roads to ride them on. Periodic wars between France and England throughout the 1600s lead to uneasy relations between French and English settlers. The French and the English is a wonderful, another one of these love-hate relationships, because of course there are several episodes where the French and English are at war with each other. In fact, Maine will be contested ground between the English and French in the 1620s, in uh, the 1650s, and again in the 1680s and 1690s. So we tend to naturally think of these two sides constantly being at each other's throats. At the same time, we know that these two sides are, are clandestinely trading with each other. These people really needed each other, you know. There weren't that many people living in the area. There weren't that many merchants coming by. So if uh, a French trading vessel happens to come around the coast and you need a new chamber pot, well, you're going to buy the chamber pot. You're not going to wait for the English vessel to show up two months later. The Swedish Cavalier's slouch hat is the height of fashion in the 1600s, and Europeans desperately need a new source of beaver pelts. Then, traders discover North American beaver, which have much thicker pelts because of the colder climate. Trade with Native Americans begins immediately. Fur, very important, and for that they required access uh, to the Native Americans. For a long time, Europeans thought that uh, the beaver uh, came from some mysterious lake way in the interior that only Native Americans knew how to get to. The fur trade here is, uh, is incredibly important uh, in, in the 1600s. As uh, a matter of fact, it, it's so important that in the 1620s, the Plymouth colonists come up from Plymouth and establish several trading posts in Maine. Economically, the pilgrims um, don't make it in Massachusetts, they make it in Maine. They had come here as part of um, investment venture, and they had a certain number of years in which to pay back the cost of that adventure. <laughs> 
and hopefully make a profit for everyone. And it turned out that the Kennebec Valley provided them with the best opportunity to do that. It's a wonderful opportunity to get rich on, on the fur pelts because uh, essentially um, the fur trade uh, is, is, is one of these situations where both the Indians and the Europeans benefit. The Indians just give a few sort of scruffy old beaver pelts and, and, uh, which the English can sell for a tremendous profit in England. And on the other hand, the, uh, um, the, the Indians get these incredible goods. Uh, this high-tech stuff of their day, steel knives and fish hooks and woven textiles um, and sometimes even guns and alcohol um, that uh, they're not supposed to get. Uh, but these are things that they can't get anywhere else. So both sides uh, does very well in the fur trade because they think they're really taking advantage of the other side. The pilgrims really don't threaten the Indians the way perhaps European settlement did in southern New England because you don't have pilgrims as farmers moving here. You're not trying to clear the forest. You're happy for the forest because it's where the, the beavers live. Only later, when the emphasis switches to a permanent agricultural settlement, do you really find those same kinds of tensions breaking out in northern New England that had been long part of um, the situation in southern New England. In 1639, Sir Ferdinando Gorges obtains a charter from the English king to build a city in present-day York. Gorges becomes Maine's proprietor, in charge of distributing land to settlers. Maine has an entirely different form of government than we would think of in other colonies. Maine is a proprietary colony. Uh, essentially, Maine is, is given out by the English king to a series of different proprietors who are given entire townships, and it's up to the the proprietors, the owners of those townships, to bring over settlers and give them land. They would all get little plots, like a biggest plot would be like 50 acres, and yet there's thousands of acres around them, but each person got just this little piece of land because they were still kind of under that English influence of, and for them, 50 acres must have seemed like, a, you know, a ranch. Because there are few roads, most travel takes place on Maine's waterways. As a result, the settlements stretch along the coastline, like a ribbon. We have houses sort of strung out along the river valleys, with house lots fronting on the water, and uh, oftentimes the rear boundaries are never even marked out. The most important piece of real estate ownership in Maine in the 17th century was like today, was having that oceanfront home. This is the first time many of the settlers own their own land, and despite the long hours and back-breaking work, they're grateful for the chance to create and control their own wealth. But their enthusiasm is quickly stemmed by a force they cannot control. I think the thing that caught them totally unexpected was when they uh, suddenly found out about winter. They were not prepared for winter in Maine. This is the period of the Little Ice Age, when temperatures all over the Northern Hemisphere, and especially in what we know in this area, were extremely cold. And we hear uh, stories of people losing their fingers and toes, uh, just not having enough clothes. Uh, one of the things that they had to try to do was to build a house that would somehow help and so you'd build a house, but basically what that did was slow down the wind a little bit. One individual, uh, a, a Reverend Samuel Sewell in Boston, was writing, and this was like 1698, 1699, talking about sitting next to the fireplace writing, and he had to quit because the ink kept freezing. In Philadelphia in the 1750s, when Benjamin Franklin finally invented the stove, which this is way towards the end of the Ice Age, things are warming up, he bragged that now that they had this wonderful new stove, they could br bring the room all the way up to 55 degrees. In order to heat their homes for the winter, each family must cut approximately 20 to 30 cords of wood. They use unbalanced, ineffective axes to chop down trees that are up to five feet in diameter. In addition, the settlers have to produce enough food during the short growing season to last through the winter. Everybody in Maine, regardless of whether you were a fur trader or a fisherman uh, or a lumberjack, pretty much everybody in Maine had to have some kind of 
uh, farming. Uh, you had to, had to have a garden, you had to have livestock, and uh, that was the, the most difficult thing at all, was to try to sort of carve out that, that daily existence. It's really almost impossible to survive in this period unless both men and women work and, and contribute, but this is not about working for pay. So it's not a cash economy or wage economy. You're not gonna find these women in town meeting records, but you can find them in diaries. You can find them sometimes in religious records. You can find them sometimes in court records. People who um, stand up for one another, or who barter and trade with their neighbors and share their talents with others. If the unit is broken and one of these two people die, very, very frequently these people will remarry almost immediately, within months of the death of the spouse. Uh, it seems like that's terribly crass to get married so soon, but you didn't have a choice. One of the things that I think families would pack when they left their old home to come to the new would be seeds of all kinds. And some of those seeds would be for medicinal herbs. It'd be very important that at least a few people in the community know how to grow the basic English herbs that were the foundation of medicine. Women were very often the ones who were in control of medications. They were the ones that carried down the old remedies. In terms of medicine, one of the most important roles women played was in midwifery because bearing children was by far the most dangerous thing that could happen to a woman at this time. And as I have seen the figures, something like one in five women died in childbirth, so it was an extremely serious thing to deal with. But most people who come to Maine end up staying because there is opportunity here, because there, because there is land, and because even if you're a poor fisherman, uh, you're better off probably as a poor fisherman living in Maine where you have your own house, you have your own land, you own your own boat, than you are back in England where you're probably living in, in even more reduced circumstances than you would here. We do know that a lot of people came to uh, came to Maine as indentured servants rather than as free men who in return for having their, their passage paid to New England would serve a term of anywhere from five to seven years uh, working for a master. When you've um, served your term then you're given a piece of land and the basic tools to establish a farm and there's your opportunity so you don't mind being in someone's service for a few years because you can see that opportunity, that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but in fact some of them were forced to do so. There were a number of Scots prisoners who were taken captive during some of the English Civil Wars, who ended up uh, in Maine as, as forced labor and end up being the progenitors of some of, uh, some of Maine's founding families. To make a living, many of the settlers turned to lumbering. By the 1630s and 40s, Maine is known as the best source of timber. Lumber is, is a key export, uh, as, as unfinished as well as finished goods. Uh, lumber is early on, in the 1640s onward, is exported out of Maine, just like it is today, uh, primarily going to southern New England, going down to the Caribbean. Um, much of it is going down in the forms of, of pipe staves or barrel staves. Barrels were the 17th century equivalent of the cardboard box. Everything was transported in barrels, and uh, it was in places like Maine that you had the hardwood uh, necessary to make barrels uh, to carry things. So Maine was important in producing containers. Some of the first prefab houses were made in Maine. A uh, timber frame would be built together, taken apart, put on board a ship, sailed down to the Caribbean, and reassembled there. Down in the Caribbean, the islands had been completely cleared for, for sugar production, and uh, so um, they'd buy their houses in Maine. We have uh, also the, the naval stores and the mast trade in Maine as well, too. In the, in the mid to late 17th century, Maine becomes an important place for the king's masts, for the Royal Navy and for naval stores. And those are being exported out as well too. So you see a wide range of lumber and timber products going out. And even more remarkable is increasingly they go out in ships made in Maine. Right off the bat, you, you need a sawmill, you need a blacksmith shop. Unfortunately, um, that also means you need lots of skilled help. And uh, that's hard to do. To keep, you have to import people from England with the trades. You then have to convince them that they should continue to work for you rather than to go get their own land and set off on their own. We have the surviving records from Thomas Gorgias, um, who ran the colony of, of Maine. And one of his chief headaches is clearly to keep the sawmills running. 
he's constantly writing back saying, you know, this shaft or this piece broke and our, our blacksmith it, it can't fix it, it's too big a job. Uh, on the next ship available, please send us these pieces. So that you might have months, in the beginning you might have months on end where the, where the sawmills uh, had downtime or weren't working at full capacity uh, because you had this problem of, of, of supply. And uh, those mills are here, again, as a part of that, that economic engine that's going to fuel the drive of Maine's economy uh, throughout the colonial period. In the mid-1600s, approximately 5,000 English colonists live in coastal settlements from Pemaquid to Kittery. The economy is thriving. Their relations with Native Americans are generally good, and there is an atmosphere of religious tolerance. There's a wonderful quote by Thomas Gorgias where he states that we force no men to the common prayer book or to the uh, ceremonies of the Church of England, but allow the liberties of conscience in this particular. In other words, he's saying we have religious freedom here. We're not forcing anyone to do anything, uh, but we just simply also ask that you respect our religion. So it was a remarkably uh, permissive society for that time. In 1642, an English Puritan named Oliver Cromwell challenges the English monarchy, and England collapses into a series of civil wars. Eventually, Cromwell succeeds and becomes the ruler of England. Now Cromwell's Puritan allies in the Massachusetts Bay Colony are in a position to expand their territory. For a long time, they have wanted to control the province of Maine. In 1652, Massachusetts comes in and, under threat of military intervention, uh, essentially forces uh, York and the surrounding towns to join Massachusetts Bay. It's what, what we call, it's what we call the usurpation, Massachusetts usurpation or annexation of, of Maine. Before that, Maine was its own colony uh, with its own government. And again, in the 1630s, from an economic point of view, Maine had everything going for it. And it was Massachusetts that didn't have, had all the people, but didn't have the natural resources that Maine had. Um, and uh, that's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for Massachusetts when the government here really sort of fails, uh, because then they can come in and control the region, and with it, control the natural resources. With the problems of a growing population, Maine's first jail is built in York in 1653. was a whipping post by the York Jail, uh, and there were prescribed numbers of lashes for different crimes. There was also, of course, the ultimate punishment, the gallows. There were also less severe forms of punishment. York actually had a ducking stool, which means you're strapped into a chair and ducked into the water and soaked uh, as a punishment. It was again a public punishment, uh, generally reserved for women who gossiped. While local crimes are handled by local magistrates, conflicts about trade or issues involving the French or Native Americans must be addressed by the new government in Boston. With the Massachusetts Bay Colony in control, Maine has an absentee form of government and laws passed in Boston are hard to enforce locally. And the elders are forever and ever trying to tell the Massachusetts government, we want a, an appointed person on the ground, someone appointed by you to conduct the trade fairly and to control it. Massachusetts also wanted the same thing, but it was the frontier. They didn't have the assets or the diplomatic skills to pull that off. It's the frontier. It's not a very well-structured situation. In 1675, King Philip's War begins in Massachusetts because Native Americans are being crowded off their land. The conflict spreads north and ushers in nearly 50 years of intermittent warfare on Maine's frontier. By the end of the 1600s, most Native Americans flee their villages, and almost all of the English settlements in Maine are abandoned. There is a tremendous amount of suffering. There's a tremendous amount of migration out. And uh, for, for years at a time, people from Maine find themselves as war refugees uh, living in Massachusetts and New Hampshire 
uh, with uh, living a sort of a hand-to-mouth existence depending on the public welfare of relatives and, and, and foreign governments. I don't think in some ways that, that Maine ever really recovers from those economic lows of the 17th century. It makes it a very different place today uh, than Massachusetts. But for the most part, there seems to be sort of the spirit to, to live here and to try to remain here. Uh, this, this enduring effort that lasts for decades. Find out more about early European settlement in Maine by logging on to our website, mainepbs.org. Production of Home, the Story of Maine on MPBN was made in partnership with the Maine State Museum. Major funding was provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, a federal agency committed to fostering innovation, leadership, and a lifetime of learning. Additional funding was provided by Elsie Viles.